Good evening. My name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you all for coming out this evening. In honor of our men and women who serve in uniform and protect our freedoms around the world, if you'll please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. Please be seated. Assembling my introduction of Eric Metaxas was a challenge that I set for myself in the way of picking just the right adjective. Eric is a English major as myself, so I think he'll appreciate this. I set about to write his introduction in such a way that if someone asked me to define Eric by one single word, just would that, what would that word be? Now, it's not easy. He's too multifaceted. For example, if I were to mention the name of Ronald Reagan to you, a number of you might quickly come to the word conservative. If I were to mention Barack Obama or Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> most of you would probably think of the word liberal. Some might use... <laughs> That's sad. Okay, if I were to say Brett Kavanaugh, you might say courageous. But who is Eric Metaxas? So let's try intellectual. Now, that's a word, that word's a good fit. You need only listen to Eric for a few minutes, read a single one of his biographies, or essays, or opinions, or works of poetry, to know that he is incredibly sharp. He's what we call whip smart, very quick-witted and intelligent. But that doesn't completely do the trick for Eric, does it? How about evangelical. Indeed, he is certainly that. Recall for a moment his stunning remarks before the National Prayer Breakfast in 2012 in an audience that included the aforementioned President Obama and Nancy Pelosi. God is not fooled, he famously said that morning in Washington, D.C. Let's try prolific. He is certainly that, too. The author of Martin Luther, If You Can Keep It, Bonhoeffer, Miracles, Seven Men, Seven Women, Amazing Grace. The list goes on and on to include 30 children's books as well. I love the title of his most recent, Donald Drains the Swamp. <laughs> his works have been translated the world over. Humorist would be in our vocabulary to describe him, too. His humor pieces for the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times, and elsewhere are the stuff of legend. Omnipresent. Omnipresent. Not like God, mind you, that might go a bit too far. But I'll belabor some prepositions here. You'll find Eric across the airwaves, on Fox News, in the Wall Street Journal, as an MC, published among 20 languages, amid the bestseller lists, inside magazines, around the network, speaking at commencement ceremonies, and behind some of the best biographies you've ever read. Let's try this last, more modern day adjective on for size, Trumpian. It may have come as a surprise to many, but for an intellectual such as Eric to come to the fore in 2016 in support of Donald Trump in opposition to politically correct lip service practiced by many was only natural. To quote Eric, not only can we vote for Trump, we must vote for Trump. With all of his foibles, peccadilloes, and metaphorical warts, he is nonetheless the last best hope of keeping America from sliding into oblivion, the tank, the abyss, the dustpin of history, if you will. 
Oh, if I could only write like that. <laughs> Try as you will as I have, one quickly discovers that it's impossible to define Eric with a single adjective as I set forth to do. He has kindly agreed to sit with me for an interview this evening on a number of topics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming for a conversation on stage at the Reagan Library, Mr. Eric Metaxas. I, I've got a word to describe Eric Metaxas. Embarrassed. <laughs> <clears throat> Mortified, almost. That was so kind that uh, I'm going to be taking you to task for the rest of your life on that. That was way too generous. Thank you so much, John. It's really, this is, uh, this is gen gen uh, uh, genuinely humbling to hear you say those extremely kind things in this extremely uh, wonderful, hallowed, really, place in front of these wonderful people. Thank you so much. How come my wife's not here? It's a pity, isn't it? <laughs> to waste this just on me. Thank you. Uh, an honor to have you, Eric, really. Um, Eric, let's start with, um, you're famed for a lot of things, but um, one in the main is your three, three of your historical biographies. Uh, Wilberforce, Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther, the most recent. And, uh, men who lived in dramatically different times, different roles in life. But in writing these three biographies, did you find, is there a, a thread in common with such magnificent men? Yes. They're all Jesus freaks. <laughs> <laughs> They're unapologetic uh, about their faith. They understand that the most important thing in the world is knowing the God of the Bible and being known by him and giving him everything you have in the very short season that we're on this earth. And so that's really the, the main reason I wrote about them, I have to say. Now, uh, your two other books, Seven Men, Seven Women, um, and you extolled uh, the virtues of uh, Mother Teresa, John Paul II, uh, Jackie Robinson, Rosa Parks, others. Uh, would you, uh, what I came away with is a very similar thread there too with respect to Christianity and, and yeah. their faith. Well, I mean, it's interesting because in those books, I was a little bit more concerned with, how do I put it? Uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't say that. It's really true of the biographies as well. It's not just that they had faith, but that they did something with it. In other words, you can't have a faith and not live out your faith. If you, live out, if you don't live out your faith in a way that people know it's your faith, probably you don't really have that much faith. You're just kidding yourself. And I think because we live in this you know, enlightenment culture, everything's rational, so you say, well, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. The devil also believes that God is, exists, uh, you know, so you don't really get points uh, for that. Uh, it's what you do about it. Do you give him your life? Do you surrender to his purposes? And so here are people that have surrendered themselves to his purposes. And what happens when you surrender to his purposes? He uses you to bless others, inevitably. He blesses other people through you. And that's what it is to be great, is to bless others. And um, I, I think that we live in a culture, since I've grown up really, uh, and I'm getting older, uh, but it's been a long time we have really neglected uh, heroism and, and saying, what does it mean to be a great man? What does it mean to be a great woman? We've neglected that, but especially great men. But, but really, that's, that's a huge cultural problem. And so I didn't set out when I wrote my first biography to address this, but in retrospect, as I moved along, I began thinking, Boy, do we need to see the lives of really great figures because those lives affect us, and we need that. We've had a dearth of that in the culture in the last 40 or so years, and I think the results are unfortunately obvious. Yeah, your book on Bonhoeffer, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's the most widely circulated, like over a million copies or something like that. Um, I know, as a, I think I've heard you say that as a 
An English major uh, you who know, went to Yale, you never in a million years expected that what you would do is write biographies. Right. And, and I, boy, when I took a look at Martin Luther, I went, oh my gosh, this is 600 pages of very heavy stuff. Um, you know, how much effort did, does that take uh, out of you uh, to put together a work like that? At this point, I just really... I just give it to my staff, and then I just I look at it. <laughs> I just I look at it when it's pretty much done, and you know, just to just to make sure that it has a few jokes. Uh, no, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, I don't use. I used some research help on Seven Men and Seven Women, but nothing else I've ever written have I used one iota of help on any level. I don't even let people read the manuscript. People say, oh, I'd be happy to, it's like, maybe I should. I probably should a couple times, but I just don't know. I mean, this might sound funny, but it's true. I don't know how to write. I just do what I, I just get it done. It's like if somebody said to you, you need to build a house, go. And you'd say, well, I've seen houses. I've lived in them most of my life. I don't know if I could build one, but I'll just start. And when I'm done, I'll know, you know? And that's kind of how I feel with, with these books, that the advice that I give people, people say, how do you write? And I say, trust me, you don't want to write the way I write. <laughs> yeah. uh, I get it done, but it's really hideous to watch the process. And uh, I've been through eight wives. You probably don't realize no. that. <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, but, uh, oh, it's brutal on them. Yeah, it's brutal on them. And um, no, the, the, uh, the thing is that... Uh, the first, the first two, Wil Wilberforce and Bonhoeffer, were, to my mind, hellish to write. People say, writing must be fun, right? <laughs> it's like inspiring. You sit in the, in the woods in a, in a cabin and you drink postum. And uh, <laughs> I, I, writing is like I would literally rather go to the dentist. <laughs> I, I Now, yes, I have a great dentist, but I kind of mean that. Like, writing is hard. I am a very scattered person. So to sit down and to focus and to... So the, the thing that I can say about biographies is that because they have a narrative thread already baked in, that makes it sort of easy to me. It's like, you can't screw it up. You start here and you end here. The rest is details. So uh, <laughs> that's how I see it, right? <laughs> uh, but... If I had to do, when I wrote my If You Can Keep It book, that was real hell because you have to create some kind of narrative structure in the argument. So anytime I write an essay, it is agony for me. It is. But if there's, if there's a, a, a plot and a storyline already there, it's much easier, which is, you know, probably explains why Shakespeare stole all of his plots, right? <laughs> we give him a lot of credit. He stole all those plots. Uh, and he, he, he actually did. It's a funny thing. It kind of makes things a little easier. Then he could just, you know, throw in some poetry. He was good, good at that. And, uh, but uh, I, I do think that, uh, you know, it's just, it's brutal. I will just say it's, it's absolutely brutal. And, but but to, so people aren't fooled that I did more than I did. All the people about whom I write are known figures with many books written about them. So I don't need to go you know, into the stock stacks of a library in Germany and, and look at correspondence. Other people have done that, and thank goodness, because if I did, I would never have been able to write these books. I'm not a scholar, you know? Mm. And I don't know that I'm an intellectual either, but I will accept it for the purposes of the evening. Mm. Okay. You called me. I don't want to argue with the founder, with the, the head of the library. Yeah, I introduced you as such, that's that. Um, well, Wait till you read Donald Drains the Swamp. You'll, you'll, you'll walk that back pretty quick, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, well, I read it about a half hour ago, so... Uh, yeah, your speech was already written, yeah. so you couldn't change it. <laughs> okay, but you have done something that, uh, for example, I don't know my agent if he's here tonight, but uh, who has said... Uh, you know, look, you're crazy. Don't try to jump genres. Uh, you know, if you write this, you write thrillers, you write thrillers, that's, right. that's the end of that. That's right. Now, how have you escaped that? I'll tell you. It's all I know how to do. <laughs> think, think about it, right? I mean, people say, well, you can't do that. Some people, for example, said, you can't say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You can't, you don't understand. You can't say it. <laughs> but sometimes people say, well, you know what? I know I can't, but... I don't know how not to say it. That's all I know how to do. 
that's, I think, what made Reagan great. And I would say that, you know, to the extent that I've done anything along the lines of what you're describing, I don't know how not to do it. I'm not a genre guy. I find uh, I get bored doing the same kind of thing. In fact, I shouldn't put it that way. It's not that I get bored. It's that I actually enjoy uh, those kinds of challenges. Uh, and so I'm always trying to do new things. It's kind of what makes me tick, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that I will... Uh, probably continue to surprise people just because I have these things that I really want to do. And now if, if, if I were younger, I, you know, I'd write more biographies and more whatever, but, I, but you realize like you can only do so much. And so uh, I, you know, I very much want to write a novel. I don't know if uh, the Lord will allow me to do that, but there, there, are, there are many different things that I want to do. And um, you know, to be sure, the downside is <laughs> you don't you, when, when you haven't done something before, you may not do it so well because you, you learn how to do something as you go along. So, but that's, I guess I'm willing to risk it just because I, I like new things. I like doing new things that much. Well, let's talk about a new thing that you wrote and then delivered and I referenced it in uh, the brilliant introduction of you. Um, <laughs> uh, your national prayer breakfast speech. Um, right. Yeah. Can Can you give us some context for that? How do How were you even invited in the first place? And when you got the invitation, to you know, it just. Well, I'll tell you the truth. This is true. Um, I know some of my heroes have were never invited to speak there. Chuck Colson never spoke there. Oz Guinness never spoke there. There are a number of other people. So. It's not merit-based. <laughs> it is utterly unfathomable how they choose the, the speakers. And some of the people in that process are, are kind of screwy. Uh, I say that in a positive sense of being screwy. Uh, but I knew when they chose me, when I got the phone call, that like a number of things in life, it didn't make sense. The only explanation was, this is Jesus. This is God doing something, choosing me for his purposes. And because I knew that emphatically, it took away all the pressure. In other words, I didn't think, ooh, I better, I be I better nothing. If God chose me to do this, it, the responsibility is his more than mine. And uh, although he doesn't type, I had to type it. But um, I, I have to say, you know, really, uh, people say he could do everything. I, well, maybe he just doesn't want to type. I had to type it. But I, um, but I, was, not, uh, I was not at all, um, I was shocked, really stunned, to be perfectly honest. In fact, when I, I got the phone call, I was, I was getting a haircut. Uh, or just before to get a haircut, and I got a phone call from a friend in Alabama who said, Eric, I just want to tell you, you're going you're to be the national prayer And I'm listening, and I'm thinking, uh, I, first of all, I thought it was a state prayer breakfast, or I'd spoken at state prayer breakfast. So I thought, okay, so why are you calling me up like to tell me that? And then she says, I don't think you understand. I'm talking about the national prayer breakfast. And I said, oh, excuse me. And I'm not kidding. I was sure that it was a very minor role. They have sometimes people will read a scripture or something, or they have a couple of things and stuff. But when I actually spoke to Jeff Sessions and said, uh, you need to get Mueller out of there. Uh, <laughs> I, you need to step up, pal. Uh, when, I, when, I spoke to Jeff, when I spoke to Jeff Sessions, the senator, he made it clear to me, like, no, you're the speaker, and I thought, Wow, that's, I mean, I, I was, I mean, I'm routinely stunned by things. I was stunned. And then I thought, okay, how do you do this? What do you write? What do you say? Okay, so I, I, I watched a bunch of the previous ones. And I can say this, most of them are bad. <laughs> why? But why? I'll tell you why. Because there's a heavy emphasis on this is really bipartisan. It's really mm -hmm. bipartisan. Bipartisan for most people means you can't really say anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing can have any tang to it. It's, it's got to be a little bit, you know, anodyne and bland because there's going to be Democrats in the room. Be careful. And I thought to myself, that's not right. You know, uh, you're not paying me enough to give a crummy speech. Uh, in fact, I didn't pay anything. So I said, boy, you're going to get it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, if the less you pay me, the more you don't know what you're going to get. So I thought, all right. So, so I watched all these speeches, and I honestly thought, these are not good. Like, this is so anodyne. They, they're really afraid of saying anything. And then I watched the one, 1994, Mother Teresa. 
And that blew my mind. And she spoke with a moral authority, power, that comes from God. And she spoke about the unborn. Uh, some of you remember uh, the Clintons were there. And, you know, it's often portrayed as though it was kind of like spike in the ball and like, you know, no, it was nothing like that. Uh, she did not set out to embarrass the Clintons. She's too gracious for that. Although she's strong enough that they were embarrassed, but she certainly didn't want to embarrass anybody. But I thought to myself, you know what, if God has given me this opportunity, and for sure, in my mind, it was God who gave me this opportunity, I'm gonna say what I think he wants me to say, period. And it was because of Mother Teresa that I said I must speak up for the unborn. And anyway, so it's, it sort of developed that way. But I, I really, um, I, I was not, I wasn't nervous at all. I really was not. I, I was. Uh, you know, Eric. After the fact, I, if you kind of look at uh, the analysis of it, it seemed to me, in some respects, it was played up as an ah, ad. Take that, Obama, and you spoke before him. That's you right. Know? And That's right. So and a, in about, fact, a friend of mine who may be here wrote a piece, I think was in the National Review, kind of skewing it that way. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because like, there's a part of you which enjoys that, and then there's another part that goes, I, I want people on the other side to not to see it that way. And I actually thought the following year when Ben Carson spoke, I love Ben Carson, but I, but I, I actually thought he went a little too political, like kind of in your face. Like you have to, it's a trick, right, mm -hmm. to be to honor those on the other side, but at the same time to say something to them that they might not, not want to hear. So it's a really tricky thing, but I just felt really strongly that I, I've got to say some things, but I want to make sure that I do it with humor and grace to the extent that I can. You know, it's not, uh, there, there's no formula, but um, I think the best you can do is just at the end of the day, you confuse the heck out of people and they don't know what to say. They, yeah. they, can't, they can't really hate you because you said nice things to them, but you said some stuff that they would like to hate you for saying. And, and I, you know, to me, that's, that's how I process grace. That's, you say stuff and then people have to actually think about it as opposed to just go, yeah, great, or just bat it away. They actually have to think about it. So that, that was my hope. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That's the long answer. Would you prefer the short answer? I have that also. <laughs> no, I, uh, do take this one. I, I remember uh, at the time you handing your book, uh, Bonhoeffer, to the president. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you ever get a response from him? Did he, no. You know, you don't, yeah. yeah, I don't think he has staff. I never got a thank you, no. <laughs> He's the president. They only have, you know. <laughs> One or, one or two people. I never did, actually, and I was surprised because I thought to myself, at least a, pr a pro forma note, you know, would be framed from a, a president. Uh, but no, I, I didn't. I was uh, obviously surprised not to get something. I mean, I gave him the Bonhoeffer book and the Wilberforce book just to be a jerk, you know, like I was kind of being, I was teasing him and saying, I know you have no free time, here's another book and stuff. Um, but uh, no, I didn't, and I, I assume he's the president, he doesn't have time to read those things, and you know, but uh, in, in any case, uh, at least he owns them. <laughs> Re reading these books, you know, doesn't automatically solve your problems. Uh, I got a phone call, I was in Colorado once, and I, I had spoken at three services at some big church, and I was exhausted, just wrung out, going to the parking lot, and this guy uh, who'd been at the prayer breakfast and had talked to me and said that he was friends with um, Harry Reid, blah, 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 and he said, oh, hey. I gave him the book and he read it and his family loved it and whatever and all this different stuff, I said, okay. And uh, as I was walking out of the parking lot, he's like, you know, I was like, what? And he goes on his phone, and he goes, hang on, Senator Reed, and he gives me the phone. <laughs> Let me just say, don't ever do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. So, but it's such a funny thing, because there are a number of people that I know who have read the book, and you realize it doesn't, you know, uh, you hope that it opens them up a little bit, but it doesn't, uh, just because somebody reads it, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't change everything. But uh, we pray and we hope, right? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, the lives of saints in your life. Uh, you know, oftentimes you find in the struggle of a, one saint or another, there's this, you know, they come to faith through sometimes very strange ways. And I, I've read um, um, that 
You'd graduated from Yale with your English degree, but you're like, oh, what am I going to do next? You didn't have a clue. In fact, you were asking yourself all those questions. Yeah. You moved back in with your parents. You're thinking life has no meaning. Yeah. And um, what happens next? Well, the good news, I was wrong. But, uh, <laughs> but at the time, I didn't know that. So, um, yeah, it was a real agony, real agony. I mean, I gradu- imagine my parents are working class European immigrants. They work hard. Uh, they love me and my brother to death, and, and, and I get to go to you know, Yale University, and what happens when you go to one of those places? Uh, typically, they, 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 they suck your brain free of logic and values. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that, that's just what they do. And, you, and your parents pay for it, you know? So, uh, so I graduated just utterly unmoored from anything. I had drunk the Kool-Aid and was really wondering you know, what is the meaning of life? Christianity can't really be true because it's too right wing or something. And somehow I just was floating, trying to be a writer, really failing. And I didn't have anybody to say, here's what you do. I mean, my, my parents didn't get to go to college, so I was totally adrift and lost. And I, I killed some people. I probably shouldn't mention that in a crowd <laughs> like this. But, um, but it was, no, I was not some big sinner, but I was really just lost and floundering, and in my misery, ended up finally moving back in with my parents, which is exactly what happens if you flounder a, a, out of college mm-hmm. for too long. You end up moving back in with your parents. And then while I was there, uh, in my real misery, because if your parents are European immigrants that have put you through Yale by working menial, difficult jobs, you probably don't want to move back in with them. <laughs> and my parents... Uh, you know, the, the standard joke I always say is like, my, my friends from Yale, like their parents would say like, oh, Eric's finding himself. And my parents would say like, yeah, you should find yourself a job. That's really the, that, that's great. So I, I, uh, it was a horrible year. I got a job as a proofreader at Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut, which is my hometown. I mean, you could not design a more horrific thing for Eric Metaxas to do, just horrifying. I mean, I've written poetry, I've written humor. Now I'm gonna work proofreading you know, uh, texts of chemical manuals and stuff. It was, it was utterly horrific. And in my misery, I met a man who was a very serious Christian. Uh, I dedicate my miracles book to him. He started sharing with me and sharing and sharing and sharing and sharing. But I, I was in enough pain to say, you know, keep, keep talking. What about this? What about this? But I was, I, I'd been trained to avoid these people. So it was this kind of cat and mouse thing where I was really not interested, but at the same time, I couldn't help wondering about this or this. This went by for the better part of a year. Uh, and one night I had a dream and God spoke to me totally miraculously in the dream and literally overnight everything changed and I was, you know, what we call born again. I was never, uh, I never looked back. My life changed literally overnight uh, in a miraculous experience. Um, and suddenly I knew, oh yeah, life has meaning and God wants to use me to, to tell others that life has meaning and it's beautiful and we can ask those questions. So, mm. um, I had the great opportunity to talk with you on your radio show a few weeks back and um, you know, it's just fun because you go in depth, but it's just absolutely marvelous and fun to listen to you on your, your radio show. Yet it's also great to read what you've written. It's great to hear you give speeches. Where do you think you're, are you, where's your most natural element? You know, what, what would you like to be doing the most of all these forms of communication? Other than being unconscious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, I think, uh, and I, I mean this quite seriously, I'll probably continue to do all these things I hope for the rest of my life, but, but the main thing, the thing that I have not done very much of and that I really feel is God's particular calling on my life is to do something not unlike this, uh, to, have a, to host a mainstream TV talk show along the lines of Dick Cavett where you, you get to talk to people and uh, sometimes it would be sort of serious like this, other times it would be a little goofier, kind of like my radio program where, where sometimes it can be really serious and other times it can just be hilarious and nuts and kind of mainly uh, entertaining goofiness. I really think that that's something that I, I want to do as much in the mainstream as I can. You know, I don't want to do it uh, really on conservative TV or on uh, Christian TV. I, I'd like to 
to try to reach beyond that as as I'm able. You know, not not everybody loves Ronald Reagan, for example. So, but who cares about them? <laughs> so, but uh, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> Shift gears. Um, were you surprised that uh, Donald J. Trump succeeded in winning the presidency of the United States? Yes and no. Um, everybody said to me, I mean, everybody said to me, there's no way he's going to win. And, you know, like, there's just almost laughable. Like, look, you need to, like, cut your losses now. Like, you, you just need to, like, forget it. And I have to say that, I mean, this, I, I, to this day, I am, probably for the rest of my life, I will be totally nonplussed by people who seem to think there was some third option. As far as I can tell, I mean, just today I'm emailing with a, you know, a, a, a very conservative Christian friend at you know, National Review, and it's clear that there are some people that just despise the president, and I think to myself, look, you don't have to love him, but you do understand Hillary Clinton was going to be the president if he didn't get elected. Like, did, did you miss that? What did you think? And the thing is, you're talk, I'm talking to brilliant people. And I don't know how to process that. Because I think to myself, even if you hate Trump, go ahead. But you understand that you have to hate him more than the idea of a presidency, a Hillary Clinton presidency. I cannot, for the life of me, fathom what I'm missing, I swear. And this is rare that I can't really figure this stuff out. But I cannot figure, I mean, this is many Christians and many arch conservatives, and I, I just don't know what to say. I have nothing to say. I, I think that they're missing something. But in, in any case, to answer this question, really, I, in my gut, and I can, I can claim because I'm a, uh, you know, spirit-filled Jesus freak kind of Christian, <laughs> that I, I just had a gut sense that he can't lose if he loses, he loses. But in my gut, I thought to myself, there's no way I can accept it. And, and I must do anything mainly to prevent a Hillary Clinton presidency. Because I, I was convinced, and I'm still convinced, and shocked that others aren't convinced, brilliant people, that we would have lost everything. If you have two or three more Supreme Court justices in the mold of Sotomayor or whatever, game over for the United States of America. Anybody who says, well, we can come back, baloney. We cannot come back. And if we could, I wouldn't have voted for Trump. But we, we can't. And I thought, this is it. So in my gut, I just thought, first of all, let me say this. I believe in prayer. And I really believe my wife and I were praying. Many people were praying. I thought, God can do anything. And if God shed his grace on this country, which, by the way, he did, outrageously for the purposes of the whole world, not just for us, let's face it, he blessed us to bless the world. If he cares about this country, and if he cares that, I, I thought, I'm going to have to do everything I can and pray as hard as I can, and nonetheless, when Trump was elected, I was, you know, giddy as a schoolgirl, and, and really, I still am. So uh, <laughs> it's just, it doesn't make human sense. He had the entire Republican establishment against him, unfortunately, the Bushes, whom I have loved, I thought disgraced themselves, uh, and a number of people that I re respected, I thought disgraced themselves because they, they really didn't seem to understand what was at stake. Uh, with all of that, somehow, uh, the deplorable, you know, still beating heart of America decided we're gonna go for this guy, and I, uh, I, I, am, I am shocked every day when I realize that he is the president. Do you think that Trump won or Clinton lost? Yes. <laughs> I do. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think, I don't know. I think um, there's no, that's, uh, that's kind of like what's the sound of one hand clapping. It's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think is the single most important thing that President Trump has done in his first two years in office? Uh, the single most important thing that he has done. Um, well, I, I don't think that I could pick a single thing. I mean, the obvious, uh, easiest thing would be to say the, um, you know, picking Supreme Court justices in, in the mold of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. I mean, I have to say it again. Uh, our hero, Ronald Reagan, picked some big stinkers. Mm -hmm. 
If Reagan can pick stinkers, you got to give big props to a guy who picks two super winners. You have to say, wow, uh, this is, he understands what's at stake. And so I think that that's the most dramatic. But it really all goes according to his whole personality. I mean, the whole idea that, the fact that, that he uh, put the, uh, the, the embassy in Jerusalem, that kind of stuff, I mean, that's what, what um, that's, that's the definition of what we call leadership. That's exactly what leadership is. And, and again, I think of Reagan. When Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, everybody said, you cannot, you don't understand, you can't say that. How many times did he take it out of the speech? Seven times the State Department took it out of the speech? <laughs> well, leadership says, I know I can't say that, but I'm going to say it because I know I have to say it. And I'll deal with the results, so. You know, I think a number of people in this audience and all around the world have prayed for President Trump to succeed. I wonder if you believe that prayer is actually working. There, to me, there's, there's no, there, there can be no question. Uh, he never should have been elected. It, it had to be the prayers of the saints. Uh, it, it had to be. And I believe that uh, he, I mean, let's put it this way. Uh, if God is for you, who can be against you? I think... God is using this imperfect vessel for God's purposes. And there's nothing anyone can do uh, ultimately if, if this is God's purpose. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have to pray. It doesn't mean that there's not a battle. But I think that um, he is doing things that aren't just blessing America. Because, by the way, if it's just about blessing America, we're not supposed to be jingoists. We're not supposed to not care about the rest of the world. It's kind of like saying, well, I take care of my body so that I can bless my wife and my daughter and my family. You know, it's, it's, you cannot help the world if you are Venezuela. So we need to be strong so we can bless the rest of the world if you care about the rest of the world. If you care about Mexico, if you care about, I mean, if we had an infinite amount of money, we could let these uh, refugees in tomorrow and we could, do, we could do all kinds of stuff. We can't, things are limited, but we wish we could. Uh, thank you very much, that's the next question. <laughs> this caravan snaking its way now through Mexico, maybe 15,000 people and counting. Yeah. Um, you know, look, as a Catholic, um, you know, the church would have me say, hey, these are people in need. I don't care whether you want to say well, it's Of course there are people in need. I mean, there's people in need all around the world. Think about North Koreans. Think about there's people in need all over the world. This is, see, this is like sophistry and emotional game playing. It's cynical politics. There's people in need in this country that people don't give a damn about those people. And it, it doesn't, I mean, the idea... That, that because the cameras are on them and because whatever's like, we've got to let them, that's, that's, that's like emotional manipulation. I mean, if a father leads a family that way, you know that's a weak man. Mm -hmm. You don't want a husband or a father like that. And if you have a president who's like, oh, it's going to look bad if I did, who cares? I mean, you've got to worry a little bit about that because that's part of the political game. But my gosh, if you care about what's right and wrong, you know, you, you don't reward the child that whines the loudest. And that's where we are right now. It's like we're gonna whine and scream and whatever. My second Catholic question. That was a Catholic question? Okay. <laughs> Uh, Pope Francis. Yeah. Have you watched Bad. this? Uh, yeah. What, what's happening there? <laughs> well, I mean, my my, I mean, it's kind of funny because even though I wrote the book on Luther, I am extremely pro-Catholic uh, Christian. I mean, I, I learned that from Chuck Colson, and I have to say that my uh, dearest Catholic friends, uh, notably John Zmirak, who's often on my radio program, are extremely upset with this with this Pope for many many reasons. So. I'm not sure what I can say, not being Catholic, uh, th there's not too much to say, but I think that, let me just say this, you know, John, in my estimation, John Paul II and Benedict XVI were truly, truly great men, and I, I don't think that uh, Francis is, is anywhere near them. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grieved right now that he's not, he's not leading in a way that he needs to lead on a number of fronts, let's put it that way. Um, another current events topic, uh, public discourse, uh, civility in the world of politics and in faith. Uh, 
how do you, um, are these mobs that we're seeing uh, that are accosting senators and elevators and oh Yeah, it's kind of funny. Know? I got into a real rhubarb the other night with Juan Williams on Fox News. I'm, I'm almost never on Fox News, but they, they had me on the other night on Shannon Bream, and he was on, and the, and the whole subject was mobs and jobs and this whole kind of thing, and I thought, you know, there's, there's a game playing that goes on in the culture. Like CNN will, will only find whatever instances they can of violence among you know, Trump supporters and whatever. But you have to stand back and look at the whole. And you have to say, you know, what is, what is the bigger picture? The bigger picture, in my mind, is, and the Kavanaugh hearings illustrates it perfectly, when you run out of uh, arguments and you run out of innings, I mean, imagine, like you're down 15 points, and it's the ninth inning. Uh, they don't call them points in baseball, I know that. <laughs> um, but you're down, let's say you're down by 15, right? What do you do to win anyway? You cause a riot, or you do something like that, because you know you can't win. So to see the Democrats do that, and to see that kind of the rage, the, the theater in the Senate gallery, people shrieking like demons and, and blood-curdling screams. I thought, these are not people that understand what it means to be an American. These are not people that respect what it means to be an American. These are people that want to win. They don't care how. And when you don't care how, that is the definition of the mob. You will do whatever it takes to win. We've been a country of law and order and, and, and of respect and civility and so on and so forth and fairness. And so I really think that, that in their desperation, they're resorting to this. And God bless Donald Trump for having the maturity to stand up to it. Because I have to say, a lot of Republicans whom I would otherwise respect, my guess is that, that they would have caved in or that they would have, they, they, they didn't have the stomach for that level of, of a battle, and this president does, because this, so that's the long answer. The short answer is yes, these are mobs. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are people that are vicious, they don't believe in anything. I was in New York the other day with my wife, walking uh, down the west side, uh, just near Central Park, and we hear something, you know, sometimes you get a weird vibe, there's cop cars, what's going on, what's going on? We then see a genuine mob of unhinged human beings. Now, some of you have seen this kind of thing, but if you're around people that are really unhinged, violent, despicable, it's scary. They were saying, F the cops, F the cops, but they didn't say F. And it was violent. You could feel the seething violence. They were surrounded by cops who were there to sort of protect them. I thought, if I pick up a two by four to like crush one of the skulls of these idiots, who would not let me do that? The cop. Irony of ironies, that we live in a country where these children, these maniacs who don't respect anything are protected by, by the cops. It's kind of like when, you know, an adolescent rages and rages and rages and slams the door. Who's paying for the door? Who's paying for the room? Who's paying for your food? Uh, it's, we're kind of at that point right now where um, I think what's interesting is that I think Trump has the stomach uh, to, to do what he must. I always think of, because I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, there were people uh, in the opposition to Hitler who were too gentlemanly to see what they were dealing with. And there's a time when you have to say, listen, like you cut it out now or, you know, you go into your room, <laughs> you're going into handcuffs, like this stops now. If you don't have the stomach for that, these forces will, will take over. Just like in 1968 and whatever they, you know, the, these students took over university presidents' offices and the, it's no different. I mean, it's a stunning thing. Exactly 50 years ago, precisely the same thing. You have weak liberals who, who don't have the moral authority. They think, what do we know? Kids know everything. They're, they're smarter and more, they have more moral authority than we do because they're young and we're old and corrupt. If that's your view, you're not gonna be able to stand up to these children who are destroying education, by the way, for everybody who paid for it by taking over these offices. That's kind of what you're dealing with right now. And I, and I think that, so you need real leadership who, who answers to the, 
you know, to the, to the common men and women. And uh, so, yeah, these, these, unfortunately, these really are mobs. And, and, and we, we're going to have to take that seriously because they, they take it very, very seriously. Yep. I have 50 more questions, but that would not be fair. I'm going to... Uh, we'll spend a few minutes with uh, questions from our astute audience. Uh, and what we'll do is we have staff with microphones floating about here. If you have a question, if you just raise your hand, we'll put a microphone in it and we'll go work away for about 15 minutes. Oh, you hold it? Okay. I, my turn? Yes, sir. Ah. Well, Jerry Seinfeld's tagline was, a show about everything. No. And you're a radio You guy. meant, you meant, I say, say. A show about nothing. Right. Oh, I can write that. Anyway. Close. I want to know, how did that idea come up and from whom? Your how, tagline, a show about How did my tagline come up? Yeah. Well, I thought of it just because I'm, it's kind of funny because Chuck Colson, I don't think there was a speech he gave where he did not quote the Dutch statesman Abraham Kuyper. Uh, he, every time he would quote uh, Kuyper and say, he was a statesman theologian, Abraham Kuyper, and he would, there was a quote, he said, there is not one square inch of the creation over which Jesus Christ, who is sovereign, does not say mine, or that's close, right? In other words, that every part of creation, not some religious corner, but every part of the universe belongs to God, and he wants us to bring him into it. I just preached on this in Tennessee the other day, that we're, we're supposed to bring him everywhere. And the secular world, and sometimes the church, would have us carve out this kind of like religious area, right? I mean, it's like what Hillary Clinton said, we're going to have freedom of worship, not freedom of religion, freedom of worship. So you go in that little building, and you do your weird rituals, and then when you come out, you bow to the secular authority of the state, right? Well, no, the founders gave us freedom of religion, not freedom of worship. And they said, when you come out of that building, you live out your faith in a robust way everywhere you go. Not only is it legal, it is the strength of American liberty. So when Tocqueville, uh, sorry, when, when Kuyper says that, you realize that uh, we're supposed to bring our faith into everything. So I wanted to do a show, because I'm generally uh, just an eclectic person, that, that can go anywhere and talk about absolutely everything so that people can say, well, it's a show about theology or it's a show about politics. Or show about... That's not God's calling on my life. My calling from God is to, is to bring him into everything and to talk about everything. Uh, so, so that's the, the main part of it. But the second part is I thought that it was a nice kind of, you know, Philip on the, the show about nothing. So this is the show about everything. And I'm a huge fan of Seinfeld, so I... <laughs> Uh, right here. I'd like to know how you ever bridged from veggie tales to brilliant biographies. <laughs> it's so funny because it sounds like I really made an effort to bridge. Uh, I, you know, that's like saying, how do you, how is it that you go from brushing your teeth to being literally unconscious for eight hours? How do you do that? And then you wake up and then you're conscious again and then you brush your teeth. Like what? What do you, what's the process? Uh, I have no idea. I think that I, just as much as, I mean, I could joke around like an idiot at the drop of a hat, or I could get really serious at the drop of a hat. You, I mean, you've seen some of that. It's just, that's just who I am. And so I don't know, I don't know how not to do that. And uh, I just, you know, I only work for VeggieTales because I needed a job, and they gave me an opportunity to, to do some of that stuff. Uh, so I, I, you know, I would, I think most people are, are more like that than not but maybe most careers aren't. So I'm just uh, you know, able to, to get away with it somehow. I don't know. Uh, yes, right here. Uh, how is Donald Trump like Martin Luther? Well, I, this is like a standard line now that I use whenever I'm talking about Martin Luther. I say that he, he's such a wild man that he makes Trump look like Mike Pence. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's kind of true, although, that gets a big laugh. I don't know. That's uh, all right. Got to make sure I use that more often. Um, but um, it, it's kind of true. But the, the, there are dramatic similarities. And, and I didn't, you know, as I wrote the book, uh, it, it, these came clear to me. The main one is that, well, there's, there are several. Okay. You, you have a figure who is kind of a wild man. Okay. Donald Trump, if you watch him carefully, 
He's a stinking genius. He's what's called a genius. But he expresses himself sometimes, you know, like a thug. And so <laughs> people think, well, he's a thug. He's an idiot. No, he's not. Martin Luther was able to be the most brilliant theologian at the highest level, writing in Latin for his peers in theology. And then he was able to crack ribald jokes uh, with the peasants and, and write in German on a very simple level to communicate with the people. And you think, who has that range? It's an amazing range. Now, Donald Trump is not writing white papers, but at the same time, uh, he has this ability uh, you know, to be the president of the United States and all that goes along with that, which if you think about it is staggering and frightening how many things you have to you know, know enough about to be making these decisions with some wisdom. And at the same time, he can speak directly to the people. And that is remarkable. But what makes it more like Luther is that there was, in Luther's day, a new technology. It was the printing press. And for the first time in history, literally, you were able to do an end run around the powers that be. The powers that be, obviously, was the very powerful church and state. If you dissented prior to Luther, they could crush you like a bug. And they did. Jan Hus, 100 years before Luther, did almost exactly what Luther did, said exactly. They crushed him like a, like a bug. They crushed him. Luther had the advantage of the printing press that was just invented. And he was able to write in the vernacular, and it went straight to the people. And it did an end run around the gatekeepers, right? Now, if you think about it, it's hilarious. That's precisely what Trump is doing with Twitter. Ronald Reagan had to have a press conference, and CBS and NBC and ABC could make mincemeat of what he said. He would give a speech, and then they would tell you why he's a stupid, amiable dunce after the speech. And so you were forced to have the interpretation through the lens of these powerful liberal interests. Uh, now. Uh, Trump can drive his enemies insane by tweeting anything he likes, whenever he likes, and not only do the people read it, they love it. And so it's a fascinating parallel to me. Now, you know, you don't want to make too much of it, but it, it is in some ways really wild because that's the only way you can have a revolution, right? I mean, you, you, Luther, what he did was revolutionary, and to drain the swamp and to do a, a number of the things that this president dares to try to do you have to uh, really uh, be able to break the previous molds. And, and, and through Twitter and, and some other things, he's able to kind of mainline to, the, um, to your average American in a way that you simply couldn't before. So, uh, but, but you also have to have that talent, and uh, he does. Uh, yes, right here. Hi, Eric. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm a, oh, sorry. Uh, Protestant evangelical pastor. Um, I read a, a couple of articles about Martin Luther, and uh, in order to get a more fair, balanced view, I went to some Catholic websites to read about him. And they mention and show a lot of quotes about uh, his meanness, uh, how he used uh, flatulence jokes about the Pope and different priests. And just wanted to know if, if that was uh, just when he got mad, or if that was uh, his actual personality, and how did everyone else uh, take it, like the commoners and, and different people. Well, I mean, it, it, all these things cut both ways. I think it's, and there's another similarity with, with Trump, right? All the people that are his biggest fans wish he'd like tweet a little less and not call somebody horse face and not, you know, like <laughs> he, 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 he's not doing everything right, okay? So Luther's best friend, when he gave his eulogy, you know, days after Luther died, in a few minutes, starts effectively saying, hey, we all know he was a little rough around the edges. This is at his funeral. <laughs> so the people around him, like Melanchthon and others, they were, I think, mortified, generally speaking, by some of the stuff. But at the same time, you know, they had the kind of let Trump be Trump attitude a little bit, right? That, that we can't really squelch Luther because this is what made him who he is and made him do what he did. And, and so I, th I think that... Um, that Luther, uh, you know, you, you can make too much of the bad stuff he said, or you can make too little. But I, I think that he felt, um, when he said those vicious things against the Pope, let's be clear, 
If you actually think the Pope is Antichrist, why wouldn't you say those things? In other words, it's not like you're being respectful to the Pope because you think, oh, he's the Pope. You're, you're thinking these are horrible people destroying the faithful, and I've got to do everything I can to, you know. Now, we would have a much more nuanced view of things, but at the time, he was convinced he's battling the devils of hell, and that, that the, I mean, even I think that, you know, he, he could be generous and understand that, that they're, they're tools, that, that Pope Leo especially, you know, was, was a tool of, you know, the curia or the whatever it was. I mean, he, he really, it, it's hard to, to, to draw a bead on exactly what, what he was thinking, but he, he was uh, often, you know, really foul in, in what he said. I think that a kind of like with Trump, sometimes it's just so funny that it's wildly entertaining and you can understa understand why he had purchased with the common man at, at the time. So it's, it was also a different time, obviously, uh, and um, so anyway, there's, there's a lot to say about that, but he's a, he's a truly mixed bag. He's, he's a, I don't see Luther as the kind of hero. Uh, he's the only figure about whom I've written that I would not hold him up too much. You know, there's some things about him that are amazing, and then other things about him you'd say, well, I don't know that I would have gone that far. So, Right here. Hi. How do you pick the people that you're going to do the biography of, and what's your next one? Um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I never wrote another biography. Okay. Uh, I mean that, because they're, it's just tough to do, and I think that you know, if you pick very carefully, you might be able to sell enough books so that it's worth your time. But uh, people always say, look, are you gonna write about Calvin now? I don't think so, because Calvin is not, uh, a maniac who makes for an interesting story. I mean, it doesn't mean that somebody ought not to write about these things, but I, I, it's so hard for me to write these books that I have to pick just the right figure. And even though there are many figures about whom I'd like to write, I, I don't know that I will have the time going forward because there's just so much else that I want to do. Um, the Luther thing was kind of a strange thing. I got talked into it. I really didn't want to write another biography. But uh, some friends of mine just convinced me that, hey, it's the 500th anniversary. If you're ever going to do something like this, this would be a good time. And, uh, and he is such a seminal figure and he's so entertaining. And the more th that I understood it, I thought, okay, uh, I get it. But I don't know that I would have it in me to write another book. I might write another seven men or seven women book because I can write shorter uh, stories like that. And sometimes in my other books, like if you can keep it, I write their biographical uh, chapters and things. But to write a whole biography, I don't know. I, d I am now working on effectively a spiritual autobiography uh, which you probably already realize is about me. Um, <laughs> and, and I, uh, because I've wanted to tell the story of my coming to faith growing up and, and that whole process of how I, how I came to faith, you know, and, so, and it'll end not long after I, I came to faith, but that's actually what I'm working on right now. And the great thing, it requires literally zero research. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got time for probably just two more questions. We'll go here and then over here. Eric, uh, you recall we celebrity spotted you at the Four Seasons a few weeks ago, you and Kirk Cameron. Um, my question is this. You, have been, you quoted Bonhoeffer as saying that silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. That has run throughout our culture now since you quoted him as saying that. It's not sourced in the book and you've been criticized for not uh, citing the source of that, and it's been claimed that it's not actually something Bonhoeffer said. Can you react to that? No. <laughs> um, it's actually not in my book. It's not in the book. It is used in the flap copy to the book, which is certainly not the book. I didn't put it in the book because I couldn't find him saying it anywhere. Um, but I was convinced that he had said it, so I let them use it in the jacket copy. Uh, since then, people have asked, where, where was it, where was it? And I've looked and looked and looked and looked, and I am myself convinced that he probably didn't say it. But the point is, we should be able to trace back to where it comes from or who said it. Uh, it is entirely possible he did say it, or with a lot of these things, somebody says something like it, and then it gets paraphrased. And, but, I mean, I, I go through that whenever I write these biographies. Like with Luther, there's several things that I kind of had to kind of 
research to find out why did why do people say that his wife, when she was a, a nun, was running away from the nunnery, hiding in a herring barrel. Where does that come from? Because it's in every single book. And I traced it and traced it and traced it and realized, I know it didn't happen. They're wrong. But with this, you can't really figure it out. So I don't know whether he said it or didn't. Uh, and I, I haven't really engaged. I've I certainly not defended it, to my knowledge, uh, at least not for a long time. I mean, maybe when the book first came out, but I, yeah, if you can't find it, and th then what's there to say? But the trick would be to trace back to wh who first said that he said it. That's, that's what I find so bizarre. So it's a, it's a real conundrum. Last question right here. Thank you very much. We so appreciate you. So we're with a mighty little band of people over Newberry Park that studied under Rob McCoy, our pastor. And he put us through Wilberforce that you wrote, an amazing grace, and we learned so much about you and how good you are. But the question is, as a Canadian living down here in Thousand Oaks from Toronto, I loved 100 Huntley Street and David Maines, and it seemed to me, but I couldn't confirm it, did you host it for a while for him? I hosted, the, uh, 100 Huntley Street is kind of like the Canadian version of the 700 Club uh, which is a hilarious concept, just to say that sentence, but um, on every level. But they, they wanted to launch uh, a kind of an American version of the show. And so I and a friend, now she's a friend, April Hernandez, an actress, hosted a bunch of episodes of that show. We taped half of it here and half of it in Toronto, here meaning in L.A., and, uh, you know, they kind of promised, you know, all kinds of distribution and blah, 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 blah. And it, it really never went anywhere. Uh, so it was kind of a, a, a disappointment to me. Um, but, uh, but so, yeah, I, I didn't, I never hosted 100 Huntley Street, but I hosted something that was very similar. And it, 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 was, it was interesting for me. It was a great experience for me to do TV like that, to just kind of, do, just to do it like, you know, the way I'm doing my radio show where you just kind of get in there and you do it and you do it and you do it and you do it and it, it kind of gives you some, uh, some experience. But I, I really don't know uh, what happened ultimately uh, to that. I wanted to end on a bummer, so I, I thank you. <laughs> thank you, the Lord appointed you uh, to ask me that question. But um, let, let me just say actually in closing, it, it is such an honor for me uh, to be, you know, practically feted uh, this way, uh, to have such a warm audience. I'm really hugely honored and moved uh, that, you, that you're here. I can hardly believe it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's good. Well done. Thank you. Well done. That's good. Thank you too much. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric has agreed to sign his book this evening, in fact, both books, and we will see him in the museum.